Kurt should eat me. I'm just over here. Right. And uh, Aaron and Russ. This is these, you guys have probably met Jared before. I don't know if you've met Aaron and Kurt before, but they just come on with us full time. We kind of divided the country up in the parts. And so this part of the country is going to be in Jared. And Jared's responsibility. And Kurt's going to do East of the Mississippi, and Aaron's going to do the High Plains, basically up to Montana. Right? That's set up in a way to describe it. Yep. Right. And 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 Russ is going to hurt cats. So <laughs> <laughs> at least those three cats. Anyway. So, uh, but uh, no, we'll do this really informally. So we'll kind of just do Q and A as we go. Uh, a lot of this will be review to most of you, I would think. But we'll uh, just walk kind of through. What's what's going on and, and talk a little bit about some changes in the company. Yes. You don't have to think it's right. Um so in August of this year we had a change in the structure of our company. And you probably read it in the catalog or maybe even saw the press release. But what we did is uh, we've been out um in the market trying to do some expansion and we bumped into a company called Muris. And that's the uh, logo that's up there in the bull. That's their logo. And we found that very few people have heard of Urit unless you're in the dairy business or unless you're an AI company. And then you've heard of Urit. And Urit owns Alta and Genet, the two AI companies. that are the two main, well, two of the four largest AI companies in the U.S. And then they also own a company called Transova, who's the largest producer of embryos in the United States. And they own a Clostrum. If you if you buy Clostrum, you probably buy in their Clostrum. If you, if you read the label, it says that it came from Saskatoon Clostrum Company. That's their company. They own a software company for dairy cows called uh, Valley Ag Software. Um, and then they have a, a, a company called Heat that breeds dairy genetics. And uh, when we first started talking to them, we're like, <clears throat> oh, that's cool. You breed dairy genetics. Huh? What do you do? He's, well, we put it in every Oh, how many you put in? Oh, about 35,000 sex embryos a year. And we're like, wow, he's kind of serious about this. <laughs> right? uh, and we started talking to you over The more we talked to them, the more it kind of made sense for us to be in business together. And uh, at the end of the day, they made an offer. Oh, thank you. Uh oh. You can save them. Oh, he ate it. He did damage. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I bet he went in my place. I bet he went in my place. I bet he went in my my guy in the back of the room. Turn it on. 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 Their main business is distributing and making semen. That's probably their biggest business. They sell about 30 million straws of semen a year. So that means that on an annual basis, there's a cap born out of that semen every 2.5 seconds. So that's kind of cool. Um, they sell semen into 80 countries, and half of the semen they sell is beef semen, and half of it's dairy semen. And, pardon me? No. That's okay. <laughs> I thought you had a good comment or question. It's more interesting if you ask questions, Eddie. He said they don't make semen if they do their fucking wrong. <laughs> they, they're very good at producing semen. Yes, they are. Out of the rules they use, right? That's yes, very good at it. We learned that. We thought we were pretty good. That's just learned there even better. Um, anyway, so we started talking to them. And as you probably know, there's a lot of discussion now about the fact that dairy cows are getting bred to sex female semen. So they sex the semen, and they breed the dairy cow to sex the semen, and they get another cow. If they do that with half their cows, that's all the cows they eat. The other half the cows that breed to a beef bull to get them to freshen so they can milk them, they take that calf away at day one, just like they do the dairy cow. But they want that calf to be a good beef calf. 
And as it turns out, the interesting thing, we're here, right? For anybody listening online, we're at a stabilizer sale, right? We're selling high altitude stabilizers, but it turns out that the stabilizer is a very good crop for dairy. And the reason of that, if you just think about it, dairy, especially the Holstein, right? 90% of the cows are Holstein. Mm -hmm. The Holstein cow is this big, tall, narrow cow. And what she needs is to be shorter and thicker and higher marbling and better feed efficiency. And the stabilizer has all that. And then they really like it if they're short gestation and low birth weight, and we have that too. So when we go in and cherry pick the best of these stabilizer rules and A on the whole seed cow, we get a really neat feed family. And uh, it turns out they're really better than a lot of the other dairy cross animals and some of the other AI that we've ever used. Hey, look, right? Do you want me to share it to you? Sure. Yeah, I don't, you don't, you're fine. You don't have to share. I'm running the slideshow over here too for this recording. Oh, so you say you should be shared more. <laughs> Do you want me to share it to you? No, we want you to share it to the Zoom. Are you on the Zoom? Are you on the Zoom? You want me to share it Okay. Are you sure? Oh. Technology. I know. Sometimes Russ undershares, sometimes he overshares. Pam tells me this. Pam's his wife up here in front. She's not in there. I'm sure we're okay. We're going to keep going. Yeah. Can you advance the slide, Greg? Do the slides show up in there? No, yeah. Yeah. Craig, if you, if, if you get out of the Zoom, and then. Just let the slide yeah. So we got to talking to him about this idea of stabilizers were better. And then about the same time, we had a feedlot that bought some stabilizer and sire calves from us and fed them. And then they came back to us and said, hey, can we have an exclusive on stabilizer? And we said, oh, they must have fed okay. Yeah, they were okay. Uh, and so we ended up making a deal where yours bought our company. Yours going to put that semen in the hundreds of thousands of dairy cows. And that feedlot's going to buy back the calves. And the, the reason I talk about all that, because everybody's like, what does that have to do with our business, right? If we think about the business we're in raising beef calves, what makes our business tough is that, like, you come here and you buy a really good bull, and then you go to sell your calves, and it's hard to get more than average for your calves, right? So you're stuck kind of retaining ownership to get the value out of them. If you sell them, it's hard to get paid for. And uh, some of you here in the audience retain ownership. Some of you don't. Uh, it would be neat if they would show up and buy them for what they were worth. That's kind of what we got going on in the dairy system. We got a premium system that pays the dairyman more for the calf than the dairyman pays up for the steam. So the basically genetics became free to the dairyman. Now, now the dairyman wants to use the best demon, right? And the, and the feedlot guy pays for it. And if we could get that going in deep, if we could come to you and say, hey, your calves are going to be worth. We'll run the indexes on them with the DNA and we'll say, what's your cap are worth? And you'll get that back as a premium over market. Then we'd be cooking with cats. And I think that's where we're headed, right? We're meeting with these big feedlots all the time. We're talking to them about how the DNA technology predicts what happens in the feedlot. We're saying, if we could get together a big supply of these cattle, would you, if we could? And we're getting really close to that. And, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen in the next few months or in the next couple of years, but. It's a, it's a really interesting discussion and it's going to change the way we do business. I think I think it's it's going to change even the way we look at buying genetics because the B lot's going to say to you, hey, the better this is, the more I'll pay, right? So then it just, it values the whole system. And I think that's where we need to go. And so we're excited about that. Oh, we got Chris. Well, that's working. No, we got Yeah. So they put 30 million units of semen. They figured out. That, that our indexes are working, that our genetics work pretty good, and they like the idea that we raise a lot of bulls. By raising a lot of bulls, if you think about that, we're, we're going we're gonna to collect semen on about, let's say, around 50 bulls to breed a million dairy cows. Okay, so those 50 bulls could be pretty special, right? And the other thing is, when we have better ones, we'll replace the old ones and so we're just on a kind of a like a gerbil on that little thing running, right? And just running as fast as we can to make that best. 
and we we want to move to that. But when, when this when yours bought us, they said, "Well, how many cows are in the co-op first? He said, "Well, it's over ten thousand cows." They said, "Well, how many embryos you put in those cows?" They're like, "Well, I don't know. We put in about fifteen hundred embryos." And I'm all like, "Yeah, we put in fifteen hundred embryos." So how many you put in? That's really close to thirty five thousand. And they said, "Well, why don't you put in twelve thousand embryos or ten thousand embryos in those cows? Why don't you raise them all with embryos? How much better would they be, right?" And so that's the way this company thinks. And so it's, it's pretty cool, right? Because we're all about genetics and we've been running fast for a long time trying to make the genetics better. And here's a company with markets all over the world and it's just starting to get percolating. I got an email a couple of days ago that said, can we send a thousand embryos to Poland? I'm like, you know, never would we send a thousand embryos to Poland, but these guys have offices all over the world and they're starting to call it and say, could you do this, could you do that? So it's, it's really going to be good for the future. Uh, and we have this closed loop deal. Um, there's a the feedlot called GK Jim Farms. They buy a lot of dairy calves and uh, they have uh, their own calf ranch. So basically, we sell the semen, they pick up the day old calf, it goes to their calf ranch, it goes to their feedlot, it'll be a closed loop, and all that data will feed back into our database. And that's, that's what's pretty cool. And so we're excited about that. Data is a big deal. And we're working on developing that. Today. So, We've been saying this a lot, right? That our goals build better cows. We've been saying that, you know, we used to advertise lots of feedlot data. We've, we've done less on the feedlot data, not because feedlot data is bad, the feedlot data is great. But we figured out that, that what matters most to ranchers is the cow. <laughs> so we said, you know, that this is, how good can we make the cows? And, and I think really in a, in a large way, you know, Craig Hayes is in our organization now. He's Craig Waves, so everybody knows we're sitting over there in the corner. And uh, Craig is in charge of quality control in our system. And when Craig came, there were some some of the fundamentals that I think our cattle weren't doing as well as we need them to do. And one of those was udders, and one of those was feed. And uh, Craig has really been instrumental in trying to up that game. Now the EPDs for those traits. We just implemented an EPD that's how likely the bull is to pass his semen test in 15 months. And now we're selecting with that. We've got the maternal SARS. Everything's designed now to help you make the best decision, buying bulls and make better cows. Uh, and I think that's that's really the first and foremost. I think I think we do get confused over what's really important and what traits drive the bottom line. I put up there about uh, nine different traits up there that cover most of what you can think about when you're going to buy a bull, right? But I think that the hard thing is you open up those catalogs and all that data in there, including in our book. How do you distill it down? How do you make decisions? And, and we see people looking at individual traits and trying to make decisions out of that stuff. And when you do that, how do you balance that stuff? Well, you know, on your cow calf operation, we kind of know what the drivers are, right? I mean, we, we you're worried about what you have for sale, which is what the weaning weight and what are those calves worth, right? That's what you're going to sell. But at the end of the day, the reproduction trumps the weight, okay? And that's where so many people got confused, I think. I think if the average person in my business, seed stock business, including ourselves, got wrapped up around the growth numbers instead of looking at the reproduction numbers. We were chasing growth and carcass and carcass weight when we should have been thinking more about how fertility, right? And it turns out that those things are antagonistic. It's like anything, right? If you're going to go draft a football player and you draft the best offensive lineman, guess what? They're not also going to be the best wide receiver, right? Because it's a different thing, right? So when you draft the best wide receiver, if you put them on the line, they're not going to block that defensive tackle, right? They're just not. They can't. It's the same thing here with these traits. And it turns out that, that when we select for growth in particular and size, cow size, we really negatively impact fertility. And so we've seen that. And the breed that's changed the most on growth has been Angus. And that's probably the breed that has the least fertility now because we've made a small British cow into a great, great British cow. And she's bigger than our environment can take. And if we feed the dickens out of her, she reproduces just fine. And if we don't, she struggles, right? And so we're learning that this reproduction thing is a big part of it. And related to that's longevity, right? Longevity is an important trait because the longer a cow stays in your herd, the less 
the cost per cow, put her in. Okay? When you put that, when you can keep that heifer and sell that cow. By our math, it's going to cost you about 900 bucks net, right? You skip it. We're getting best salvage value ever out of cows, but the efforts are worth a ton of money. Then. So that the thing just rides up and rides down. When you figure the net, it's about 900 bucks. If you're, if you're doing it poorly, it might be more than that, right? But hardly anybody we know is getting it done for much less than 900 bucks to get a heifer bred in the fall that's replacing the cow you call. Okay? That's the way we're doing that math. And so we were at King Ranch in Texas and we were driving around. I said, well, what's one of the most important things to you? They say, the average cow on our ranch has 8.3 calves. Wow. The average cow. That means they got cows out there really great. Because right? uh, <laughs> we know they got cows that one calf left, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and that's what they're working on. They say, that's our number one driver profitability. Okay. And, and so that, and, and that's this longevity thing, right? Cows that leave the herd early cost you money. What happens is if you have that $900 and you have one calf, that one calf has to pay for that $900. Guess what? It loses money. We can't pay that $900. Because by the time you figure the cost of making a calf plus the $900 depreciation on the calf, you can't, maybe you could this year, right? Maybe you could this year. Maybe you almost break even this year, but it's tough, okay? Uh, and then the other thing that's a big one <clears throat> is how much does the cow eat? We're probably not good in this country at stocking rate. Okay. If I asked any of you what your cow, what your ranch will carry, you usually tell me a, a number of cows. Okay. What's interesting, if you go to New Zealand, they tell you a number of stock use, right? And that could be up with seven sheep or 0.7 pairs or one yearling, or they get the stock units. And so they so they're thinking about how they can stock that grass. And they're thinking about how much dry matter production they can make. And they're thinking about ways that they can stock that grass aggressively, make it grow better, and put more animals out there. In a sense, your ranch is the same way. And we did this math a long time ago. Did you remember? We were, at, we were in Arkansas, and we gave a talk and said, you're going to produce more pounds per acre with small cows than you are going to be with big cows. And then a guy at, at that talk, they went out and measured that, didn't they, Bruce? And that's where we got that chart we have that shows how the percentage of a cow's weight to, to calf wean. If you have a small cow, you can wean 50%, right? An 1,100-pound cow can wean a 550-pound calf. A 1,600-pound cow is probably not going to wean an 800-pound calf, right? So, so you don't. And so you think about this, we get an X amount of grass to eat. You basically can put out X number of pounds of cows to eat that grass. If those cows are smaller, you're gonna you're gonna wean a higher percentage of the cow weight that your ranch runs. Does that make sense? It's a really it's a really confusing thing. But what it amounts to is if we could stock heavier, we make more money on the ranch because we produce more total weaning. Okay? And we can do that if you if you if you do the math, you could run. 1,400, 1,200 pound cows on the same grass that you could run 1,200, 1,400 pound cows. <laughs> and so it's the same man, right? You have same tonnage of cows, but those 1,200 pound cows are going to weigh more of their weight. And so the total weaning weight you get on that is going to be higher. Now. Okay. So the challenge is that's what we want to select for it. And I do this talk all over the world. Everywhere I give it, everybody nods their head and says, that all makes sense. And there's a couple other traits, right? We, we want utter quality, we want docility. Those traits are kind of hard to put a value on for a dollar, right? So we want it. Everybody nods at that, but the challenge is how do we select for that? Because that's pretty confusing. Okay. There's a lot of stuff going on in that system that is our ranch, right? And, and how do we select for that? And what traits do we get? And, and this is where. We, we got this cow from Village DVD that came out now two and a half years ago, I think, Frank. Does it sound right? Yes. About two and a half. And, and, and I, I always say it's the most important DVD that most people have never heard of. And, and it is cow fertility. We put it in as fertility, but it's cow fertility. And, and the way it's measured is we get an EPD back from Zoetis that goes from like minus one to plus four. And what that says is if the average, go back to King Ranch, average cow there has eight points here, right? So in that herd, a plus one bull's daughter would have nine points. 
and a minus one rules down to that 7.3. Okay, but it's taking the average number of calves that the average cow gets, and it's saying, is it more or less? So we got that EPD, and we're looking at it, and, 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 and our whole team was looking at that number. We said, we know, we've been told all our life that fertility is really important genetically, but we don't know what that trait's worth. We don't know how to monetize that. Because what it sounds like to us is if we're King Ranch and we got an 8.3, that if that bull's plus one, we're going to get one calf at the ninth year. And that doesn't seem very valuable to us. Okay, because, yeah, as he said, maybe, right? But, but at the first, we're like, well, that's one calf nine years from that. Right, so would we give up meaning weight tomorrow to get one calf nine years from now? Didn't it's kind of seemed funny to us, okay? And then and then we start kicking it around, and one day we said, Well, what if the reason they they get one more calf is that they have a higher annual calf crop percentage? Right? And if you start thinking about it, that's the only way you get one more calf. Right? The reason you get less calves is because you're open more often. The reason you get more calves is because you're bred more often. So now I said, wait, wait, that's a different trait. That's not one more calf at the end of the life. That means that out of every hundred daughters we have in a bull, how many calves are we going to get every year? And that's what that EPD predicts. Okay. And that's what that chart shows on the left. It goes from 60% to 100%. Right? And as that Plus number gets bigger, that percentage gets higher. So as soon as we, so we sent that to King Ranch, we said model that for us. King Ranch Institute down in Texas did that modeling for us. They made that graph. And we got that back and I said, well, that, that can't be right. That says that a bull is plus three is going to mean in the 90s. And that says that that bull down around minus 25 is going to mean in the 70s. Can't be right. So I'm kind of a data guy. So this was this was last year, and I said, well, we, or a year about a year ago, I said, well, we got Cook's capitalist, we got lots of daughters out of it, and he's a plus three and a half, and we got 18 carat, and he's down at the bottom end. <laughs> Bill and I know we had lots of daughters, right? They didn't last long. Okay, and so we go into the database. And, we, and literally those two bulls we had we had uh, 400 daughters of capitalists at the time and 700 daughters of 18 carat. And so I said, when they first calve, this is not what this predicts, but it's just the way I look at it. If they calve once, how many more calves they have? Versus how many they could have, right? So if they if they calve their first calf last year, they got last year and this year. So they got two slots, what they fill? If they calve six years ago, the first time, now they got six slots. How many they fill? Well, 18 carats filled 72%, and uh, uh, yeah. capitalists killed nine, uh, filled 93%. <laughs> okay, so now we're like, uh oh, <laughs> right? If it really predicts that, now that's really valuable, right? And it does. It does. And when we look at it, the bulls that are at the low end of that scale kill your herd financially. Okay? Because they come in and they produce a two year old or three year old or four year old that lose a cat. Yep, Bruce? If you want to buy some 18 karat daughters, I've still got some. You still got some. <laughs> and, and that guy's name was Dr. Tom Troxel. Correct? Who? Tom Troxel. Tom Troxel. Did he use the bull AI? He's the one that did the study for the university for it. Oh, he did that. He was he read Tom? No, he did the study you talked about about the cows. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but he has 18 karat daughters? No, I do. Oh, you do. You got me lost. They're for sale. Huh? They're for sale. Okay. All right. <laughs> now they're amazing. You still got them. I don't know. You let, did they miss one? No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, but, but, but so here's the thing. Okay. When you get down at the low end of cap crop percentage, it costs you a lot of money. Why? Because A, you got the same cost to run the cows, but you're not getting as many calves. And B, your depreciation cost per calf is you. It's you. The percentage of heifers you have to keep at the low end going way up because you're sending too many cows out as opens or calls unless you start keeping the cows at skip. Right? And so it's this, it's this incredibly negative draw financially. And so when we went, let me just back up two slides. 
We back up. We looked at this function, right? The biggest driver of that financially is fertility. It's that reproduction piece in the middle. And it's it tied right in with longevity. So when we redid that math, as King Ranch estimated what that EPD was worth, 80% of ranch is fertility. 80%. Okay? And then ranch puts pressure in the right direction on all those other traits. Okay? So fertility is the most important trait, but what do you do with it? You select for ranch. Okay? If a bull's high on ranch and he's only three stars on fertility, he's still high on ranch. Okay? You select for ranch. Ranch is the best predictor of the cows. Okay? Now, you've got a couple other things to think about, which is that we're just, you know, uh, cutter clone and, and, uh, and the other, and that's why we have the cutter system, right? This is lot three from the sale. He's not only five star cabin, he's four and a half stars on the turtle, five stars on fertility, four stars on udder, right? So that maternal star deal tells you not only is he high on ranch, but his udder quality and fertility are right at the top. So it's kind of like making sure that all this stuff is done right, right? Because if you get a really high ranch one that has bad udders, guess what? You're going to kick them out anyway, right? You're going to kick them out anyway. So, so that maternal is a, a simpler way to look at it. But this pulls off the chart. He's plus 180 on ranch. It, that means what that says is that we would expect his daughters to stay in our herd and produce calves over 90% of the time, their whole life, which is super bad. Super bad. I, I, I laughed about that comparison of 18 carats. And so after that, I, I knew that Matt Jones is one of our reps in South Dakota. He AI to let the cows to uh, the, the capitalists. And so I called Matt and said, How are your capitalist dogs? This is after I did this analysis. And he said, Well, they're really good. They're great cows. He said, You know, I got a lot of funerals that. I said, You do? He said, Yeah, we were freight checking the other day. He said, I had to ask my wife. I said, Have we had an open funeral? He said, well, We had three out of 97. It worked. Right? It's working. Uh, but anyway, it's going on the IX here. The IX is using a ton of uh, high range bulls. Their, their feedback's going really, really well. I think they their DNA test on their heifers this year, their average fertility EPD was 2.1, which is really high if you go back to that chart. 2.1, way up there, third bar almost. And uh, their ranch average is a, is a 98 or something. So. Super high. Aaron just did one of his customers did some replacements we sold and they were over 100, right, Aaron? 107. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when we get those high ranch dogs, right? And if you think about it, the average ranch today is 60 ish in the database. I don't know. You can look at the catalog. If you look at a 50th percentile ranch before we'd be, I think, around 60. So if we go back to lot three and we said we breed 180 to a 60, we're going to get 120. 120s are what? On the on the female, top 1% commercial females. Okay. So that's how far out these bulls are on that ranch number. They're like if you pick those top bulls, you can breed an average female so those top bulls and get top 1% calves. Pretty cool. Right? It's pretty cool technology. So so at the end of the day, it's just one number, it's just ranch if you're gonna sell weed. Okay. If you're not going to sell it, meaning there's a lot more complexity. And if you're at this sale, you're probably also here thinking about pack, right? Because these cows are not all at an altitude, so you got to worry about pack. Um, and we know, you know, I mean, I go to England every year, and they they they've tried to collect for pack, but their highest hill is 1,200 feet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any pack issues. Okay, cow a cow. If you're a cow and you're born in Ireland or England. Went pretty happy. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't have a bad day. They, when it's bad, they take them in the barn. Okay. They literally, no, I'm dead serious. They put them in a barn on a straw pack. Uh, and and we're you know we're testing a lot of bulls. The bulls that are here, um, except for the fall bulls and uh, a few of the other bulls, right? Correct. Ten more bulls. Is it, is it marked in there? Do they know? They're not certain. Okay. So almost all these bulls, not all of them, but almost all of them were tested at 8,200 feet, right? And we go up here to Walden every year, we hold the bulls up and we test them there. And that's the basis for the EPDs. And the EPDs are working, are working really well. 
And this is the original chart. You know, uh, I, I never did go look it up, Craig, but we must have over 12,000 yeah. PAP squares now, right. or something like that, right? And, and that's the way PAP EDD is correlated to PAP score. And what we do is we sort the bulls, we take the altitude now. But as we do that, Holt, when he, when he, Dr. Holt, when he, when he tests them, he's like, man, these, these bulls are tested lower and lower because we're sending lower and lower PAP EBDs up to be tested, right? And so the whole thing is, is clicking along, right? It's, it's not, it, 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 you know, we're working in a biological system and, and PAP brisket disease, I should say, is, uh, impacted by the animal's potential to not have the problem versus the stresses and challenges the animal has, right? So if you buy a low path EPD bull and your calves get all kinds of sick respiratory wise, you're still gonna have some prescription problems, okay? That's, now with a low path bull, you're gonna have less than you would have had, but you're still gonna have, it, right? I mean, if, if we take animals over 9,000 feet, and they have respiratory problems, they're gonna struggle, okay? These bulls that are better on PAP, we're gonna have less of those problems, right? And I think as, as we look at how to select for that, the thing we say in the book is that the guarantee is minus 0.7. Do we have anything above minus 0.7 in the sample? Right, um, five, eight, seven. <laughs> 84% PAP need less, 84% have less than 0.7, minus 0.7. Okay. So those eight, 84 out of every 100 bulls in the sale are less than minus 0.7. So if you're going to take them out, don't buy one that's above minus 0.7 on the EPD. I don't care what his PAP score is. If his EPD is higher than that, don't buy him. Okay? That's just a real simple deal. If you're having a lot of problems with brisket, there are bulls, the average is minus 1.5, right? The average is minus 1.5. Yeah, so if you buy something below minus 1.55, you're gonna be pretty safe because this is a pre-selected set of bulls and you'll be below average mm -hmm. on that set of bulls, okay? And I know I know our, our cooperators that are having the most problem with brisket, they're trying to buy minus twos, okay? That's, that's what they're, I don't know, is that about what you're thinking, Bill? Right. Interestingly, going back to that deal, we said that the British cattle have a lot of trouble with this because it's the highest still 1200 feet. The French have the Alps, and the Charlotte cattle went up in the Alps. You have brisket in the Charlotte? <laughs> this is a very interesting thing, right? You get what people selected for for, for centuries, right? And those cattle in, in the continental Europe that went up in the mountains during the summer, they lived in the house and in the barn attached to the house, and then in the summer, they put a bell on them and sent them up to the top of the mountain. And most cattle got selected for high altitude by doing that, because the ones that didn't work out. And so it's, the, but, but it's the British breeds, of course, which is what we use a lot of, right? Angus, red Angus, we use a lot of that. Those are the breeds that are susceptible. Just a word on that. What about your cat? What's driving your meaning when you value? What's driving it? The value of the cat's meaning. Uh, there's a huge spread in the value of these calves, probably more than $600 on today's market. Um, and the big driver in that feed efficiency is feed conversion, which is predicted by the feed to gain and feed in there. Um, interesting side note, one of the reasons that we're in a deal with, we're in this um, Euris company today is when we fed the stabilizer sire dairy cross calves, we beat everybody on feed conversion because the bulls we picked were negative on feed to gain. That thing works. It was, okay? It's a big driver today. In fact, there really are two big drivers on your cat, one of them is feed conversion and the other one is marbling or carcass fat. Those are the two, if you're gonna retain ownership, those are the two things your cat have to be good at. Okay, the feed conversion and marbling. You, you also want them to make heavy carcasses, you want them obviously to stay healthy, um, but the first two, feed conversion and marbling, drive way more value than carcass weight. If you think about it, if you get to a heavy weight inefficiently and you don't marble, you're not gonna make money. You got to a heavy weight, but it cost you a lot to get there. And when you sold the meat, you sold at a lower price. Okay, so that's why that worked out. Feed efficiency. Um, we've measured over forty thousand animals now. Um, we're continuing now to, to advance this. We're starting to measure animals on finishing rations on feed efficiency. I think you're going to see some new traits come out with our analysis on that. 
by measuring what they need, we have really good predictions of there are huge differences. These two bulls, everybody, and they might not have seen this slide. They might, they might want to just say they didn't see it so I can explain. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so these two bulls are born at the same time for the same week, about 600 pounds, and a yearly weight of 1,200 pounds. One of them made 17 pounds, made 1,842. And those differences are 40% error. And a bull that eats 42 pounds, quick mass test, if he's going to convert it four to one, how much do you have to gain? He's eating 40 pounds and he converts it four to one, he has to gain <clears throat> over 10 pounds a day. Has anybody found a bull that gained 10 pounds a day? No, they don't need it. But what that tells us, because we know we have cattle that convert four to one, they don't eat 42 pounds. Okay. To convert four to one, you gotta be like the other bull, because he converted four to one. He ate 17 in game four. And that's doable. Rare, but doable. Okay. So if we look at what happened in the selection of chickens, chickens convert more than twice as good as they eat. They eat the same amount of feed per day as they used to. So they made them grow faster without eating. And so we want to stay away from the big eating. And then on our we want to get as many cattle as we can in the big circle there, the red circle. We want to grade upper two thirds choice and prime. We have very nice choice, low choice strip steak tonight, right? We cooked it slow, it was very tender. If we grilled it, cut it thin and grilled it and overcooked it a little bit, it might have been tough. And that's what that 62% says. That grade. If you cut it thin and cook it to a medium degree of doneness, 38% of the time, people are going to say that meat's not good. Okay. And I mean, picky people, not that they did food professionals, right? So they're talking to restaurant people and food critics and that kind of thing, right? And so, you know, they're wanting a high standard, right? Which is what we have made. Well, we got up into that middle, that upper two thirds of choice, they said 85% of the time it's good. And when we got into prime, it was 99%. Right? If you ask what our cattle are going to be like 10 years from now, the cow is going to be a little smaller. The cow is going to be super fertile. The calves are going to grade all in that circle. And they're going to convert it better than five to one. But that's where these numbers are moving. Right? That's, that's what's going to happen. Okay? And the only question is how fast we get there. That's the only question. That's where those numbers are pushing. <coughs> okay, now it really confused. It's just he just said beet conversion and, and marbling and harvest weight. And confused it, right? What we knew is that Dollar Ranch is it, but look, if you're gonna feed the cattle, you can just select for dollar profit. But it's gonna make the cows dollar profit now. It used to be the dollar profit was more feeder. Than it was ranch. You guys probably all remember that. Aaron screamed it. Aaron just stepped out, but Aaron screamed us. He was our senior rep and said, That's not what we should be doing. You need to change the index. The cow's more important than the bigger animal. Okay. And when we put fertility in, it is more important. The variation in fertility that we weren't grabbing before is so big that you can put a bad fertility bull as good carcass. And good feed conversion, and you still lose money. Okay. So if you select for high profit, you're going to get high range, and you're going to balance the feedlot stuff with the range. So if you're selling a weenie, it's just range. If you're selling it at your, I mean, at, at a finished animal, it's just dollar profit. Lee, yes, I don't want to break your train of thought, but it's broken. But, but what our comp, what our competition is doing with chickens. They're growing a pound of chicken at 1.7 feet per person. I know. I got that slide coming, Bruce. Oh, I'm sorry. I took it at your place. No. And, and, a, and a chicken is always a chicken. It always tastes like chicken. It's never tough. It's never tender. It's the same. It's the same. It has no fat. <laughs> has, what, what's, this, what's this chart say right here? What's the that standard beef over on the left that has no fat? We find the label that says it tastes like chicken. 
<laughs> it actually doesn't taste like chicken. It's worse than chicken because right. it's tough. Right? At least chicken generally now is, is relatively tender if it's fresh, right? If it's frozen, but if it's fresh. Now, if you have a great piece of chicken, what's that mean? Yeah, your true. wife knows how to cook. And she, put her, and she put a really good sauce. And she put a really good sauce on your chicken. Okay? I mean, you can grill chicken. And it's going to be pretty dang ordinary unless you put a sauce. Right? Because it doesn't have any fat in it. And the flavor comes from the fat. And what they did is they took the fat out of them. And then the big guys took the fat out of them, too. But the, if you can, if you can get yourself what are those good things called Greg Berkshire's? Yeah, yeah. But get yourself a Berkshire ham for Christmas. You don't want to eat it. It's like a it's like a stabilizer and the marble like crazy. Uh no, what way out the top. <laughs> okay. So the most important thing we're gonna to say tonight. So so the two messages so far, right? And you sell your calves at weaning, you select for ranch. You guys sell your calves and slaughter, you select for uh, problems. Now we have this test you can do your heifers. Okay. At least two people in the audience have tested heifers. They're both selling heifers. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. What happens when you test your heifers, particularly if you haven't been using particularly disciplined bulls, is that there's an enormous amount of variation in the dollar profit of your heifer. Again, Aaron's not sitting here, but we, we had a customer of his who buys Charlotte bulls from us, and I'm feeding the calves. And I said, you got to start testing your heifers because you got some heifers going in the herd that are not good. Okay? His report comes back. He goes from 25,000 to minus 9,000 in his, in his replacements. Okay? And, and you know, I mean, there's more variation than you think, right? Everybody who tests, find more variation than you think. They say, well, is it worth doing? No, it's not worth doing. It's not worth doing. In fact, tomorrow when you come to buy bulls, just collect the bulls like you do your heifers. Leave the catalog at home and just pick them visually. <laughs> no. Well, why not? That's how you're picking your heifers. So you see what I'm saying? You wouldn't pick your bulls that way. You, I mean, I don't care how visually oriented you are, you at least want to look at that paperwork, right? At least, okay? Some of you might base 80% of your decision on the numbers and 20% visual. Some might be 80% visual and 20% numbers, but nobody says, oh, I don't need to look at the book. But that's exactly how we've been picking our efforts. We don't have a book. We don't have a book. Okay, I, I got there's a lot of variation in these bulls. We've selected these bulls highly, and there's still this much variation. In your heifers, there's more. Okay? Now, here's, here's a, a takeaway that I did not expect. The herds that are spending a ton of money on these and not testing their heifers are improving slower than the herds who are spending 25% less on bulls and testing them. And I would not have expected that, but we've tested enough herds now. Right, Jared? Yeah, we see it. We have guys that are buying bulls on a on a pretty close to average budget, right? Yeah. Sorting heifers, producing really high, really high herds. And we have other herds that are paying top dollar for bulls and not testing their heifers, mm -hmm. and they're behind those other guys. And that's we didn't think that was the case, but those of you that are doing the testing, you see it. Because you would just keep heifers that aren't in line. You just don't know what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's the reality. We don't know. We don't know it. And people say to me, well, how would you do it? I said, I'd go out and I'd say, i take the 15 or 20% of the heifers that no matter what I said about them, we're going to keep anyway. Don't test them. Okay? And then i test all the rest of them. And then what would I do? We're going to keep cows. I select for dollar range. And I'd go on keep and disposition or anything else that's giving you grief. Okay. If feet are giving you grief, you got an EPD. If disposition is giving you grief, you can call on that. Okay. But, but what I find is when we give people the numbers, they want to, they want to call on all of them. I'm like, only call on the stuff that's really hurting you. 
If the other stuff's not hurting you, just select it on ranch or property. If you're going to sell the weed, you just pick on ranch. If you're going to retain ownership, you just pick on property. <laughs> <laughs> so it's asking your hacker, like my herd, got leech money. Yeah. Before we go to captain, then don't have a lot of it. It'll still work. As long as it's Angus, it's Angus, right? A lot of Angus. Uh, so we can characterize Angus, Red Angus, Simmental, Gelby, Charlay, South Devon really well. We can characterize Herford and Limousine a little bit less well, but we can still characterize it. And then if you've got Belted Galloway or Scottish Highlander, sorry, we can't. <laughs> we don't have, the deal is we don't have those animals in our database. If we don't have those animals in our database, we can't use the DNA to predict them. Because the way the DNA works is really simple. You send me a piece of DNA. We look and say, we got animals in the database with that DNA? If the answer is no, it doesn't work. And then if we do have DNA like it, do we have data on those animals? If we don't have data on them, it still doesn't work. In other words, if I go collect a bunch of DNA on belted Galloways, but I don't have any data, I'm still not going to be able to predict what a belted Galloway does. I got to have data, right? So we're, we're gathering as much data as we can on those breeds. Obviously, Limousine and Herbert are two of the big breeds that we don't have a lot of data on. We're trying to get more. <coughs> but that's the way that thing works. So how are we getting all that data? You know, that's the group of seed stock breeders. I don't think we've ever, we started putting this in the catalog because I don't think people really knew that there were that many different seed stock breeders sending us data, right? Every one of those companies up there is a seed stock company. And they send us data and we function like about the fifth largest breed association in the United States. We get about 35,000 records a year. And almost everybody on that screen is taking cow weight, and almost everybody on that screen is taking feed division. And they're all running DNA, and they're all calculating index. And that was given our database more readers. That was another thing when we went to Europe. There were some companies that, that talked to us that said, you shouldn't be sharing that with everybody. Uh -huh. And we said, well, that's how we got the data. It's a group effort, right? And they said, oh, you'd be better off doing your own. And we said, we don't think so. We think we're better off with the group. And Uris absolutely thinks that way. They're like, you've got a big population. You've got to get lots of data. The way you're doing it, we think is right. So you got to set your goals and, and you get these indexes. We'll be adding feeder to the to the uh, output from Inherit, and that'll be coming out in the next 12 months. And you get that on there. Of course, you get dollar ranch and dollar profit. And so what you do with that result is you sort out the trait that's giving you grief. Okay. But don't go through. Some guys want to go through and they want to cap every trait. When you've done all that, then you didn't move the index as far, right? And you guys have tried this, right? It's a, it's a funny deal. You're better off moving the index. You're better off moving the index than just calling the extreme, right? Um, and uh, what do you get? You get, you get five indexes, three for the weather, dollar feeder, I mean, dollar ranch, and dollar profit from us. You get 18 different EPDs. You get how the animals rank within the population. You get the parentage if the sire and the dam are in the database. Which if you start doing your cows, eventually it'll tell you who the dam is of everything, and you'll get a almost a pedigree, and then it'll tell you which breeds is in them. The breeds thing is quite interesting because you'd be surprised. There's a lot more variation in your herd on breed than you think, right? And what you, of course you want is you want the animals that are more hybrid, and the animals that are more hybrid have higher fertility, and the animals that are more hybrid have higher dollar ranch, and that's already figured in those numbers. And that's one of the big differences between our index and Zoetison. So when it doesn't figure in hybrid vigor, we could have a whole talk on hybrid vigor. We know hybrid vigor works, okay? We know hybrid vigor is important, okay? So, so it's got to be factored in. Um, these are all the things you need to come. Obviously, that fertility EPD is one of them. You get dollar ranch, you get dollar profit. You know, you can call on birth weight or disposition or others. But what I say to people, I mean, this is literally how I do it. The guy says, well, should I, should I select? Is there... Should I call them if they're too high on milk? I said, well, are you, are you calling cows that are too high on milk? If he says yes, I said, are you having cows that milk too much? If he says yes, then I said, well, then we should look at it. He says, no. He says, no, don't worry about it. Okay. Flashpoint. 
We do not milk these cows. We don't know how much they're milking. We guess the milk from the weight of the calf. The weight of the calf is determined by what the calf does and how well the calf converts. It's not automatic that a 35 milk bilks more than a 30. What it means is the calf's going to be five pounds heavier. So people say, how is a 37 milk, this is lot two, how is a 37 milk bull a five-star fertility? Well, he is. That's what the data says. That's why. The data says they're going to be fertile. Do you think they're going to milk too much? No, because if they milk too much, they wouldn't be fertile. Okay? So, but so I literally go through trait by trait, and I said, what traits you have trouble with? I was doing this with a guy the other day. And he said, really, really? He said, you know, the only thing is uh, we have some others we don't like. I said, okay, so let's go with the other trait, and let's take everything that's in the bottom 15 or 20% on that trait, and let's just prop them on. And I said, are you retaining ownership or selling weaning? Well, I'm doing both. I said, well, let's sort on both indexes. So we lopped off the bottom on ranch, we lopped off the bottom on profit. Now we're left with about 10% more than he needed. I said, sort them on profit and go. Just go, just go. And that's about how you use it, okay? If, if, I mean, you get overwhelmed, right, Jared? Jared and I have walked through, well, and Aaron and maybe Kurt even a little bit, and Craig, we've walked through people with a lot of data. It gets us almost, we get wrapped around the axis. And, and I'll tell you what your temptation is. You want to find the perfect. Where's Jim Tomlin? Jim's not here. Jim Tomlinson likes to only use perfect bull. And my dad always said, there's no perfect bull because as soon as you measure another trade, half of them are going to be bad, <laughs> right? There's no perfect bull, right? All we're doing is trying to fix things. So we got to live with some imperfections and indexes. That's what you got. So let, let's wrap up, talk about these heifers and sellers. Um, Bill and Arlene are a product of some heifers. Um, we've changed the percent grade in those cattle quite a bit over the years. And the bulls have done that, and at the same time, um, we're changing the dollar ranch on them. He's got uh, 25 red heifers out there. I saw this afternoon. Really nice set of heifers. Um, Sire's in there would be first class and Jackson. Um, and they cleaned up and stabilized the bulls, got all their shots. Anything else you want to say about them? First stage? Start taking them to March. Okay. And the red back they have at the same time? 30 days, right? Yeah. Great. Any questions? Could build right here. Any questions? Nice set of heifers. Super nice set of heifers. Uh, and then Doug's here, for sure, Bar, and Eddie Clements as well. Uh, these guys have been doing a lot of AI, and uh, these heifers can run out of Progress, field 61, right in the black one, right? Right. And their AI back to Doc 78, SO68. Do we, do we know where that bull's at today? We probably do. You probably know about what his members are today. We have to look him up. Craig will look him up. We'll have that one on here. So, so. <laughs> That's like 24,000. 24,000. High ranch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you guys have been leaning heavy on the, on the carcass traits as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> for, for the high probability. We've been thinking for that perfect goal. Yeah, we're we're for, 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 yeah. <laughs> you bid on some of the really close. Yeah. <laughs> right. And there's five black ones and five red ones, right? Yeah. And where are the cabin? They're cabin. They are AI on May 23rd, right? Yep. Yeah. So they say March 3rd, you'll see them. They'll be done by March. You know what else? No, they you're a slum. Okay? They love short gestation length. They yeah. were meeting with a dairy the other day and they were explaining to them that our bulls would, would get calves about four days early compared to the other bulls that are being put in dairy cows. The dairy's like, that's a lot of money. The dairy has 100,000 cows. So, <laughs> so the math is 50,000 milking cows coming to milk four days earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That that was a number with six zeros. Okay. <laughs> That's what that was worth. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So those reds are luxury daughters bred back to the decree bull that we got here in about the current. Luxury's been a great sign. Great sign. Yeah. And, and both programs are obviously heavily selecting for low pass. And, and you're going to get that out of those cows. So 
they're both running at high altitude, and that's just one of the things. If, you, if you're going to defend these females at this altitude, you got to have the bigger and high altitude. So that's a scoop. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, on your DNA testing on your efforts. Yep. Can I pick up some of the fat problems? Um, that's a good question, Steve, because it will show a spread. Okay. And I guess um, if the female's in the herd and she's already producing, she's not going to give you grief for herself. But if she's got a big plus EPD, the probability that her calf's going to die is pretty high. And if we think about what we've been doing, this is the problem. Here, okay. We've been we've been buying calf tested bulls without an EPD. I wasn't quite as accurate as buying it with an EPD. And then we're keeping the heifers not knowing where they're at. Right? And we think that that EPD is pretty predictive, right? I mean, it's not 100%, I mean, especially on low accuracy stuff, right? I mean, there's some of those stuff move around a little bit. It's not 100 percent So I, I guess I, I guess I would tell you, I would call the extremes on that. Again, I go in and I'd say, if that EPD is in the worst 15 for deck, you probably got to go. Are, are you guys doing different with that? So we, we this this year we started pulling DNA on the pepper tab at Brandon. So before we were doing it after we win. Yep. But we had AI'd a few cows to an ABS pool that was supposed to be really low pep on theirs. We lost three of those calves. I uh, pulled to Brisbane. To Brisbane. I pulled DNA on them and sent it in. And they came back high. Right and, That's and, and the daughters that lived were high. Yeah. They went to the feedlot. Yeah. They did not go back in the herd. Because yeah. if you're losing a significant percentage of them, you know what they're up to the project. Yeah. Now, what you say? We've been testing every bull with PAGs since 1976. Yeah. We've been kind of yeah. 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 the original herd. The CSG and first project. And today, when we get these EPDs, they are back on tempers, <laughs> and they the average is about a few minutes. Yeah. That much spread after what, 40, 50 years of testing yeah. the bull. So there's a lot more to it than just a PAP test. But this is a lesson on genetics. Okay. Yeah. Because if you let's say let's say your average birth weight is <laughs> that doesn't mean you're not gonna get a hundred. And it doesn't mean you're not going to get a 60. Okay. Now, if you move your average down to 70, you're for sure going to get a 90, but you may not get a 100. You see what we're saying? In other words, when you make two animals back in a herd, you get a distribution. That's why in big families, the kids aren't all the same. They get the same parents. But when we make those genes, we get a spread. That's, that's how God designed animals to avoid singular genomics that would then be extincted by a disease, okay? These, these, these populations have resilience because when you recombine them, you get variation, okay? That's why we have to cull the bottom end of our bulls. No matter how high our indexes get, the bottom half of our bulls are way lower and the top are higher than the average and get a spread. That happens on every single trait. Happens on every single trait, that's no different, right? And so even if, you know, and so all you do, you, the strategy is move your mean as low as you can get it, but then you're still going to have some that pop up high and you're going to have to sort it. You're just going to have to sort it. You know, I think that's, that's, that's the take it. Yeah. And that's true on every trait. True on every single trait, right? We, we can make two animals with a marbling that's high and we can get a freaky high one. We can get one that's the average of the parents and we can get one that's pretty ordinary. And so you've got to measure it. That's why you've got to do the test. And, and I think where we're going, oh, by the way, this may or may not apply to you. If, you. if you've never, if you have cows in the herd that you haven't tested, Zoetis is running a special between now and April 30th, and you can test those cows. We're still waiting on price confirmation. We think it's going to be between $14 and $16. Okay. So they don't they have to, they have to test their heifers. They have to test their heifers next spring. Right. Yep. Yep. So if you commit to test evidence, how many? 
You have to test yeah. everything, right? So now test the whole county. Um, and uh, that, that's a super good deal. I think we've got a lot of herds that are stepping up and doing that now. Only because you might have taxes to pay. If you have taxes to pay, it might be worth paying 14 to $16 and getting your cows tested before the end of the year. And then, you know, you, you get that money you're going to give you know, Uncle Sam and the third of it when reduce the price of your DNA, right? So, so just something to think about. Anyway, um, so that that's out there. Um, I, I don't want to say that. I'm say something else. But, uh, but uh, it's great technology. I think where we're going to go, I mean, as we see it, we're going to become basically herds that test and herds that don't test. And the herds that test are going to fit into these programs are going to pay more if we can. Because they're going to DNA test calves to figure out how much they're going to I think we're very close to them DNA testing the calves to decide how to feed them. Are you seeing like this the Leachman brand of cattle and feedlots that you're picking at? Yeah. No, there's lots of good cattle out there, Steve. There are lots of good cattle. And I mean, those other guys test in their regions some really good cattle. And some of them are pure breeders. Most of them are pure breeders, actually. Most of the other ones. You know, we're about the only one that's. There's only a couple of us that are composite breeders that are on the list. But yeah, I, I don't think there's not a corner on goodness. There's a corner on doing and measuring the right things. I, I mean, what people aren't measuring, they're not taking cow weights. They're not measuring how much their cattle eat, and they're not selecting for feed emissions. That's what's not happening. And oh, and they're not selecting for fertility. Angus just came out with a fertility EPD, and the correlation to ours is almost zero. And we know ours works, and that means theirs doesn't work. And why? Because those Angus cows are in herds that are over-managing them with feed, and you can't see the difference. So that's not a big problem. Because most of these stock herds feed to make sure that they have a very low open percentage. Right? So it's just the way. And then, then you can't, then you don't have any data. You don't even care. Okay. Very good. How about a thanks to it? Well, they're not here, but I'll thank you for it. Wasn't that real good? That was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Fun. Be very good. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.